Okay, so um, last night I, I posted the uh, fourth uh, exercise uh, for the class. This is an exercise that will build on the tutorials that were delivered earlier on R, as well as the classroom material on hidden Markov models. Um, uh, the uh, exercise draws on not just the instructions uh, for it, which are posted, but also uh, the uh, a set of, of uh, three files. Uh, and excuse me, two files in the end, I guess it became. So uh, one, a, a source code file uh, containing our code. And secondly, uh, a set of data. Um, and I'd like to, to talk through it. I would uh, first just emphasize that in order to pursue this exercise, you really will want to go through the uh, instructions. Um, there's a number of items in there that uh, maybe a assistance if you encounter anything unexpected such as, such as um, if the packages need to be installed um, you may also you will also get some hints that unless you're very very familiar with R, um, may be helpful um, but I'd like to sort of just orient you with respect to it so we're on the uh, the same page here in order to do this what I'm going to do is to uh, share my screen and I'll just um, walk you through a, a bit of uh, the mechanisms here in, uh, in our studio. Um, so what you see here is our studio. Uh, many of you, uh, perhaps all of you will have encountered it by now. Um, it was something UN um, helped help students um, work with in the context of her two tutorials, uh, her two, our tutorials. Now, um, up here on the upper right, what you see is the code that's been provided to you. Again, there's there's two files provided to you beyond the uh, beyond the instructions. The first is this R source code, which I have open here, and the second is some data, which I've asked you to place, and this is in the in the instructions in the same folder as this um, uh, this file uh, here, and you know, you want to be running this code uh, while in that folder. So you can just go read in uh, that file. Um, now, beyond that, you're going to need two packages. So our, so uh, virtually all popular extant programming languages, um, whether for statistical purposes or not, um, so R and Python, for example, um, uh, or, or Sage as well. Um, uh, these are, are very popular tools for performing uh, computations that are, that are statistical in nature. And all of them uh, allow, in fact, depend upon an ecosystem of, of packages or libraries as they're called. Um, and uh, you have, you know, the Python package manager. You have uh, R and having having these uh, packages as well, and this is code that will require two such packages. And you can see the references to to them here. So this library is doing sort of an import of the things defined in this caret library, and this uh, similarly in this. Um, 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 this library for uh, hidden and, and semi-Markov models. Uh, so you're going to need those. Now, um, UN may have mentioned to you that when you depend upon a library, um, every time you use it, you have to say library such and such. So you can, it knows when you use a certain command, which whether you're using it from this library or that one, this package or that one. So here you're, you're declaring that this code is going to use henceforth um, some mechanisms from these libraries and it will import all of them. Uh, but the very first time you use such a package or library, you need to, you may well need to install it. I say may well, because it could be one of the ones with which your R installation comes pre-bundled. It may already 
have that with it um, and that you don't need to explicitly install it. And uh, when you go to execute these, you can quickly see. I'm going to highlight uh, something which I want to emphasize again to you later because it'll be helpful in pursuing this uh, particular exercise. But if you select lines in RStudio and you use this run button, it will run those lines. Um, and, and you could see in this case, it, it ran those two lines down here on the console without problems. Um, now, if I had made reference to uh, another, another module, which um, uh, you know, I hadn't prepared, um, it might, uh, it, it would tell me like, I don't know that that package. Um, not actually sure in this uh, installation of R, whether I've used, for example, the REDM package. Um, and you'll notice it says like, there's no package uh, called that. Um, and uh, in general, it will warn you if I don't know what that package is. In those cases, you're going to want to install these packages. And up here at the top, I've put in uh, a bit of code that would install those packages for you. But this code is commented out. That's what this hash character is, or this pound character. Um, if you want to uncomment it, you could simply delete that, that hash or pound at the beginning of the line. And then you could install that. Um, and if it hasn't been installed in your system, it will go through a bunch of rigmarole and install it. And, and it's doing a lot of work. It's compiling code and it's linking it in and preparing it for dynamic loading and a, and a whole bunch of other things. But the basic deal is it will get that package ready for use. And then you'll still want to do this library thing, which would use that package. Um, of course, these two packages are installed here, but um, you will you will find that you know if you if they weren't and you execute the lines, then you should be able to go on and um, and declare this library um, and, and and start using the libraries. This will allow you to start using the mechanisms that are in these packages. This is a one-time operation. To get to get those appropriate packages um, to it um, into the into the system, so that's something up front. Um, now, this exercise is based on this code and this data. Um, when you read in this code and data, what you will find is if you do a look at the structure of this data, you'll find that it has two, excuse me, it has three, um, uh, three fields of relevance. The first of them is, is the weak number, starting at zero. The second is the true state of the system. That's actually what your HMM is going to try to figure out. Um, this is just to allow it to be compared to assess how good is that HMM um, in its predictions and its estimation of that true underlying state? There's an set of observations, which is the kind of empirical data here. Uh, and synthetic empirical data, um, we know exactly under what conditions this was produced because it is synthetic. This is what statisticians would call a simulation experiment. We produce this data. Um, if anyone's interested, I could provide the code that produces it. It's in any logic. Um, but it's a set of observations over time uh, that characterize a two-state system, one that involves um, an outbreak state and one that involves a non-outbreak state. So there's these two underlying states. And the job of the HMM is going to be to figure out at any one point what state is that system in? Forget the lack of Queen's English there. Um, and what state is, is the system at this time or that time and that time, that time? Um, but this exercise goes beyond that to 
to try to identify the characteristics of the underlying process. In other words, to figure out the transition matrix that's governing that system, to figure out the rules by which that system is governed, that data generating process that's giving rise to this data. Now, um, the exercise is, is based on this code. And I've tried to fill in most of the components and you'll fill in the, the kind of missing components here. Um, you'll run some code and you'll offer some examples and interpretation. We'll go over it on Monday. Um, but the basic gist is you'll be running this code all the way from the start to the end. But there are certain areas of it that you'll just run and it's, it's routine running and you're welcome to go in and look at what it's saying and so on, but um, you're not required to do so. But there'll be four places in the code that are marked with this, this indication and comments, the beginning of a comment for exercise part variously one, two, three, and four here. And each of these comments is located before a corresponding block of code, small or large. Actually, they're all smaller, medium size, I guess, at most. Um, so this, for example, for part one, is going to ask you to um, to run this little bit of code and then answer this question here. Okay, um, it says the the below shows the probabilities of being in each state for the first for the first twenty time steps. That's what this code does. It it tells you, you know, what the probability the HMM assesses the HMM that was that was built here um, assesses. The state is being in in state one. That's the left column here versus state two. That's the that's the right column here. It, it's giving the probability of being in each of those, and it should sum to one between the two of these. So at any one time, it's taking the data into account, taking how the model underlying model um, dynamics as as uh, built by this posited. This, this positing of what the underlying model is, and it's assessing the probabilities of being in a given state. So the basic deal is you'll be going down through these exercises. You'll run the code just below this, and you'll answer the question. For example, this one asks, how does this compare with what you would have thought the state sequence would be from part one? Um, and so it is with the others. Now, the, the key thing that I want to emphasize here is in order to do those, you're going to have to run the code prior to that point. So, so you know, you're going to be selecting blocks. Okay, we already ran these two, but there's no harm in, in rerunning. And I'm going to go down and select everything up to this for exercise part one. I'm going to select it here in our studio, and I'm going to say run. And it will say, you know, do a bunch of work. And actually, if you look, there's a bunch of output there, which you're welcome to look at, but you're, you don't have to. The key thing is you want to execute all the code up to here so that you could execute this particular line of code and answer those questions in your turn in. Okay. And then having done that, you'll go and select the code down to the next uh, part two exercise. Here we go. I'm going to select this. Boom. And, and then you will be executing this code and this is going to actually show you the single most likely sequence that it believes was was obtaining was holding was was in fact behind as it were these um the, the empirical data so it thinks it was in state one in the first time step state one the second time step all the way up to state five here or time actually time four because it's zero time zero one two three four it thinks it was in state one and then it went back to state two. State one is outbreak, state two is non outbreak, as I recall. Um, and that's how it's interpreting this empirical data um, uh, up, up, up here. Excuse me, it, it looks like uh, 
state one and state two are actually reverse there. So in other words, uh, state two is the upright state. Um, in any case, um, uh, you'll be running this and, and producing um, the appropriate results. Uh, I had said state one was the outbreak state. I'm, I'm from this uh, comment. I'm actually um, reassessing that. I could uh, double check this, but um, I see that's that's indeed the correct. It's non-outbreak is the first state. Outbreak is the uh, is the second state. You could see this um, indicated in the comments here. So apologies. I'll update the uh, the the comment to that effect in the. Um, in the exercise uh, description. And then you'll go, having run exercise two, part two, you'll go and you'll run down before exercise part three and run exercise part three here and interpret uh, the results. And here you're actually asked to, to actually type some code yourself. You're, you'll be asked to experiment. Um, so this is trying an HMM or, or the first state, the non-outbreak state, you have a 50%, if you're in that state, you have a 50% chance, that's a 0.5, of going to the outbreak state in the next time step. By contrast, this one, if you're in the, in the outbreak state, you have a 35% chance of switching to the non-outbreak state. That's what, that's what that would posit. This is building an HMM and it's assessing its negative log likelihood. Uh, the probability that negative probability log with the probability that it would produce the empirical data. And you could try this with you know, different assumptions. What if this were 0.75 and this were 0.21 or whatever, and you could run that and you'll get a different log likelihood. Um, uh, this is the negative of the log likelihood. So this is like 10 to the, actually, it, 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 yeah, 10 to the minus, uh, log, natural log, I think, um, e to the minus 1994. Um, uh, whereas this was, in terms of probability, whereas this was e to the, that's exponent, um, to the minus 0. 0.11, excuse me, to minus 1174. So this one is closer to zero. It's closer, excuse me, it's closer to, um, uh, to to e to the to the zero or one um, and and so this is the log of it and so if it, if it were this probability the underlying likelihood were one its log would be zero and its negative log likelihood would be zero the closer it is to zero. Um, the bigger it is. These are more and more negative ones. This is minus 1174. This is minus 1194, the underlying log likelihood. We're just presenting here the negative of it. So this is more favorable than that, or, or higher likelihood at saying that this, that this model would have produced the data rather than that. So you're asked to try a couple of these and comment on, on that. Um, you might even try manually to hone in on what plausible values would be. Here you're sort of assessing the probability that a given HMM with this transition matrix, with these two probabilities in the off diagonal terms, going from one state to the other, the prob the, what's the likelihood that that would have produced this data? And if you hone in, if you tune those probabilities, you'll, you'll you may be able to find the one that's, gosh, pretty good. It is the least, it is the highest probability of producing this data. Um, and so that's the little challenge. Try a bunch of them and, and, and interpret them. Um, see if you can start to get some sense of what plausible ranges of values might be. Um, and then for exercise uh, part four, you're, you're going to be running this. And, and then you're going to be, um, take a look. This actually finds in an automated way, it's running an optimization routine. There's actually one built in to MSHMM, but uh, I make it a little bit more explicit here by, by running a, um, an explicit optimization routine that's basically going to, basically going to run again and again, the same one with different parameter values to try to 
try to zero in automatically on the pair of these that best explains the data that has the highest likelihood of producing that observed data. And you'll be looking at the values that result from this. It will give you back many things, but one of the things that it'll give you back is the parameter values that were most successful in, in producing it. It'll, there's other things you may want to explore, but that's the one I've asked you to look at. What are these parameter values that are shown? Um, what are the off-diagonal elements that seem to best account for this data? So here we're, we're building HMMs, we're evaluating them, assessing their likelihood of, of having produced this data that was provided to you, and in trying them out with, with different parameters, um, and, uh, and then going in and and looking at an automated way of, of identifying that, that HMM. Um, up here, you're, you're looking at, given that you have an HMM, this isn't necessarily the best one, but given that we've built some HMM according to this transition matrix and this initial state distribution and these emission parameters, these parameters for normal distributions for producing the data, What's the, uh, what does that HMM think about the probability that we're in each state at each point in time? Or what does it think is the single most likely sequence that accounts for the data uh, which we have? Um, the data which is read in from, from this, uh, this file provided to you. Um, so for example, uh, if I if I were to look at that data, uh, these would be the observations here. Here are the observations, and and what's the most likely state sequence? Which state it's in at which time that best accounts for this is the question. So that's a little exercise I've asked you to go through. It will require you to make sure these packages are ready up front, and. And then after you're doing that, you're going to have to go successively through these to each of these um, uh, parts of the exercise. Uh, any questions related to this that I could answer before we get on to particle filtering today? Any questions? Okay, nobody? Okay. Uh, oh, uh, any code example on common filtering? Uh, yes, uh, we do have code uh, from some of our work, which has to be modified. I wanted to get this out to you first, and then I'll be providing some code. It is um, MATLAB code. So uh, we had, uh, we have a published paper on applying common filtering, um, which amongst other things, um, uh, went on to, and I, I don't think this was the original paper, but I'd have to remember, it went on to compare it with, um, later with, um, uh, with particle filtering. And um, I have the code for that. I have to modify it to make it a little bit more accessible, but I'll see if I can do that soon. If, uh, if you have a need, uh, a mirror for it, uh, ASAP. I can provide it to you, you know, before packaging it up as an exercise. Um, my hope is to make it an optional exercise because not everyone has MATLAB available. But um, uh, but it will run the extended Kalman filter with an uh, SIR SEIR model um, on uh, on data. So I'll, I can provide that. Um, published papers on, um, on common filtering. Sure, sure. Um, there's, uh, there's some good, uh, good work on common filtering. What you'll find uh, with respect to uh, common filtering and particle filtering is that um, there is profuse literature within the 
machine learning area more generally, and particularly for both of those in robotics, um, uh, extensive literature. There are central techniques in, in getting robots to navigate in environments where you might have beacons and the, the robots always trying to figure out where it is um, based on the beacons, knowing the beacon signals can bounce off against metal, uh, metal surfaces and, and be attenuated and, and so on. And, and uh, you can get what are called multipath effects where it can cancel. And so it can, you might not hear a certain beacon for a time. And there's extensive literature there. What's, what's more recent is application of both those, particularly particle filtering to, um, uh, to epi. Now, Coleman filtering goes further back in epi, and there's some good, uh, you know, some, some good papers in that area. I'll provide you uh, both uh, examples of both of them. Happy to do that. Okay, any other questions? question. Okay. Um, so I'm going to 